Good morning, my friends. It's great to see all of you today. If you are visiting with us this morning or if you're new to the parish, uh, my name is Father Kevin Huber. I'm the pastor and with our deacon, Mickey Henry, and the entire parish community, we're delighted to have you with us today. Hey, uh, I'm just going to launch right into my homily, all right? I'm going to ask you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something very, very not Catholic. Are you ready? Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid of this. What is one book that you have to read every year? Somebody got a book they have to read every year? It's a must kind of thing. Anybody? No? What's that? Lord of the, Rings. the Lord of the Rings. Interestingly enough, someone sitting almost exactly the same place as you said the very same thing last night. And I have this, I have this, the, this, uh, this thought, this theory, is that you start now and you'll finish it by the end of next year and then you'll start again. So, but a Lord of the Rings is a really great option. Anybody else? No? What do you say? There, Christmas sir? Carol. The Christmas Carol? Yeah. It's a must read every year. Awesome. Anybody else? Very interesting. So this is my book. This is the book that I have to read every year. It is a book entitled The Miracle on the 18th Green. Now, if you like golf, this book you will love. If you do not like golf, you will hate this book. But this is the thing. It's a book about, um, about a man whose name is Travis McKinley. And Travis McKinley lives in lovely, exotic Wilmette, Illinois, with his wife, who is an, uh, an OBGYN, and his three children. And he is a, a copy editor at a, a publishing company in Chicago. And this is the thing about Travis. Travis has this repeating message that kind of dictates everything that he does. And it is this. I am not doing anything worthwhile. And the, the very first part of this book is all about Travis just trying to get through life just trying to do his thing with that message repeating behind him all the time. I am not doing anything worthwhile. Whether or not you and I realize it, we all have that kind of repeating message in our mind. Maybe it's not the same one that Travis McKinley has, but we all have a, a message that repeats in our mind and we may not even be aware of it. The fact of the matter is, it's, some people refer to it as a narrative. Some people re refer to it as a, uh, as a framework. Someone will repeat it or will, uh, will refer to it as a, um, as a, uh, a worldview. But at the end of the day, all of us, from our parents, from our culture, from other uh, influences in our life, we have taken on this message. We have taken on this narrative, this worldview. The challenge is that it's so subtle, it's so much a part of who we are, that it's really difficult to put our finger on. And something, something huge has to happen in order for us to change our personal narrative. And that's what you and I have to think about, and my microphone is going out. Hey, Nicole, I'm gonna borrow your microphone, okay? All right. I promise I'll give it back. All right. So this is what you and I have to think about as we listen today to this reading from the 40th chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. Remember, last week I told you that for 70 years, for three generations, the Israelite community has been in captive, has, has been in captivity. They were part of the Babylonian exile. When the Babylonians came and took them out of their country and separated them from their families and their homes and their homeland, separated them from their, uh, from their temple, their beloved temple. And for three generations, they heard the Babylonians tell them that they were not worthwhile, that their God did not matter, that their God did not care about them. Otherwise, why would they be in exile? For three generations, the Israelites lived in, a, uh, in, in the land that did not know or, or care about their history, did not care about their experience, did not care about who they are. And can you imagine the narrative they had? Can you imagine the repeating message that went over and over and over and over in their mind? 
that ultimately influenced every decision they made, every, every friendship they, 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 uh, they developed. It was just this one narrative, you do not matter. And it's into that context that this explosive uh, event took place, that God sends Isaiah into their community, and he says something that ultimately changes their life. And he says this, he tells the prophet Isaiah, go up to my people and tell them, fear not, here is your God. Here comes with power the Lord God who rules by his strong arm. Here is his reward with him, his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he feeds his flock. In his arms, he gathers the lamb, carrying them in his bosoms and leading the ewes with care. That's what Isaiah said to those people in, in the Israelite community as he was leading them out of the exile back to their homeland. They heard that God is there in their midst. And at that point, stuff began to change. Their perspective changed. Their lives changed. Their direction changed because they realized that God was in their midst, but most importantly, that they were loved by their God. And my friends, that's the whole point of the Advent season for you and for me. We realize that our God has come. He took on, he clothed himself in human flesh. He suffered and died so that he might conquer sin and death and the power of sin and death in our lives. You and I are loved by God. That's our narrative. As believers, as people baptized into life with Christ, that's our narrative. That's our worldview. You and I are loved by God and we see him hanging on the cross. And we remember that he's coming back. You and I are waiting for the God who came once. We're waiting for him to return again to, uh, to uh, renew all of creation so that we might share the glory that he's prepared for us. And every time we, we celebrate the Eucharist, we remember that pledge that our Lord Jesus gave us his body, his blood, his soul and divinity so that you and I have hope. We have hope because we know that we are loved by God. And if we're not able to hang on to that, if we're not able to, to, uh, to integrate that narrative into our lives, we have to ask our, ourselves why. But at the end of the day, when we, you and I are willing to take on that biblical worldview, everything changes. It's an amazing thing. Travis McKinley, as I mentioned earlier, spends half of the book trying to just get through one day after another. And halfway through the book, he encounters an experience that completely changes his life. And that is, he gets fired from his job, loses his job at this publishing company, and he does the first thing he knows what to do, and that is that, quite frankly, he takes $3,000 and signs up for a qualifying school to play professional golf in the senior tour. And he took a lot of risks. But this is what happened. What happened is that he actually played on the senior tour. And he won over and over and over again. And as a result of that experience, he began, he began to transform his narrative. And he began to realize that he has value. He has value. And my friends, you and I, as we enter into this, ad, deeper into this Advent season, there was an experience that happened 2,000 years ago. Christ was born. And that experience changes everything because God wants us to know that he is here. He is in our midst. And we are changed because of his great love for us. Because at the end of the day, just like Travis McKinley, we have value. And the moment that we take that into ourselves, the moment that we allow that truth to penetrate our hearts and our souls, is the moment that we see things in a whole new way.